I can't really pinpoint one specific thing that really um, made a huge difference. It really seemed like it was everything in combination. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Ruscio. I'm here with Susie and she has had some good results. And for the usual, I think it's helpful to try to share some of Susie's background and, and what she's been going through so that we can all learn and really try to take a, uh, as much away from these circumstances that we can. Um, so Susie, maybe start us off with a little bit of your, your background in terms of what symptoms you're experiencing, maybe some of what you had tried prior, and then we can kind of go from there. Okay, okay. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, I started experiencing some fairly severe symptoms in my hands of uh, joint pain and stiffness and, um, and, and not only inflammation of the joints, but like the tendons in the palm of my hand and, and uh, triggering, you know, finger triggering. And it was at the point where in the morning it was really hard to move my hands or you know, make a, a, a fist or close my hands. And it didn't resolve during the morning. It would persist through the day. And I, I'd had some symptoms um, shortly prior to that were that were less, but then, you know, it just escalated to that. And um, that, uh, that, those were the most current symptoms. Um, in hindsight, I think this actually started 10 years ago, but didn't get its roots in really. Um, but it, it definitely manifested a year and a half ago and, and stayed. So it was very concerning to me. And um, so I did reading about it and um, it was seeming to me rather than it being just by the, the nature of the symptoms, it was seeming to be, me not to be something like osteoarthritis. Um, I was thinking it was some kind of inflammatory arthritis more. Sure. So um, I read up on that. Um, uh, I uh, got a, a book out of the library from uh, Susan Blum or Bloom, I'm not sure how you say her name, who's a uh, uh, functional medicine MD who, uh, you know, is well-versed in autoimmune. And, and the, the book I got was Healing Arthritis. Yeah, she's been on the podcast. We've had a few conversations. So yeah, she's yeah. some good work out there for, for arthritis. Right, right. And so um, uh, I'd already known about functional medicine, but that got me just further into some specifics about um, arthritis. Right. And so I was trying to follow um, some of the protocol in her book. Um, uh, but it was it was not as easy to bring it together on my own. I was making some progress. I was doing things like um, doing an anti-inflammatory uh, diet. I was doing some probiotics, but that was basically like going to the um, health food store and, you know, getting some recommendations there. Sure. I was eating fermented foods. Um, uh, let's see, what else was I doing? Um, uh, oh, things sort of mechanically like contrast baths for my hands and compression uh, uh, sleeves or gloves all that helped but it wasn't tamping things down as much as I wanted and um, that's when I did more research I came across your information um, I, I got your book um, I really liked how it laid out very logical sort of sequence of a protocol and also that if need be, I would be able to get supplements through you rather than having to get them through a lot of different 
sources. Sure. So I, I thought that was beneficial. But even with that, I, I started with um, doing the uh, paleo autoimmune diet. And that was before I started working with you directly. Sure. So you started from, from more of a kind of vegetarian based diet, you know, high food quality, anti-inflammatory, and then you pivoted over to autoimmune paleo. And, you know, maybe there, you know, anything you want to juxtapose in terms of how that felt you know, on, on the joints and, and just overall? Within about two weeks, I did see improvement, you know, just through diet alone. Um, uh, it wasn't a hundred percent, but I definitely saw market improvement over two weeks. Right. And, um, uh, but then I did have a little bit, it, it was maybe coincidental, but I started getting um, twitches in my legs <laughs> at the end of those two weeks. And it was like, wow, is, is the transition of not doing as much carbs causing this? Or with, with that, and that I had seen improvement, I thought, you know, there is a lot of power in diet alone. And that I, and I wanted to, um, at that point, I thought, I don't want to work just on my own anymore. I want to work with a coach. Right. And that's when I uh, sought you out. Um, because I, for one thing, um, I didn't want these symptoms to last for a long time. Because my understanding was if the inflammation stayed, you know, for quite a while, that I could actually have permanent joint damage. So I didn't want to mess around with that. So that's when I uh, sought you out and we started on, um, um, you know, a, a more methodical regimen. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you use the term methodical because one of the things that um, Susan and I, I think we have a slight difference of opinion. I think the, the core essence of food quality we agree upon um, there, there's, there's a decent body of evidence showing that a vegetarian diet can help with various joint conditions, including RA. But when you, when you really look at the literature, there, there's actually not many studies at all looking at other types of diets, like a paleo diet. And right. So this is what can be kind of tricky where you can say, you know, the evidence indicates this is the best diet, let's say vegetarian of high food quality for some type of arthritis. And that's partially true, but if we haven't examined other diets that we know help other inflammatory conditions, like a paleo-like diet is one example, then it's, it's not fully accurate to say that's the best diet. It's one on a menu of diets to methodically try. And, and that's where just making that flip over to the autoimmune paleo seemed to move the needle. And then even further, when we did some fasting or modified fasting, that seemed to give you another kind of big improvement. And fasting really isn't a dietary intervention, but I mean, it kind of is because we use some sort of caloric solution. Um, but yeah, to your, to your point, I think, again, it's just worth reiterating uh, this, this methodical approach that kind of takes a broad view on the evidence and looks at, okay, here's a few different dietary directions we can trial for something like joint pain. And let's try to move you through these you know, not taking months on each one, but going in a decent clip, listening for a positive signal from your system, and then, you know, continuing to move forward in these uh, sort of iterative uh, updates that we make periodically. Right. Um, and beforehand, before I tried the, uh, and I, I did hear that inter, uh, discussion between you and, and uh, Susan Blum, and um, I thought it was a good discussion. Anyway, I respect both of you and, and think you both have a lot of uh, good information and a lot to offer. Um, yeah, we all have different, yeah, different perspectives and, that, and that's why it's good having the ability to kind of bandy different concepts back and forth on the podcast. Like that. Right. And um, I know in, in your book, you had mentioned, uh, and, and this really came true to, for me, that you want to set the environment first. And to me, the diet was probably the largest foundation. Right. And then, and, and also uh, the fasting and the intermittent fasting. And by the intermittent fasting, for me, that was, is trying to keep the, um, keeping the, the food intake um, 
within just a, a certain uh, time window, yep. you know, just so I can give my gut a, a rest. Yeah. So I think I th the things that I see as a foundation for myself are the diet, uh, fasting uh, periodically, not too often. I've done it maybe once every three months where I'll do like a hybrid type of fast. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, uh, intermittent fasting. And then on top of that, the probiotics. Um, and when I did the hybrid fasting, some of it was with the, um, I forget the uh, master cleanse where it's the lemon. A lemonade with cayenne. Right, right. So I did a combination of that, um, elemental heal, and then um, also bone broth. I never exclusively did one thing. And sort of how I used it was um, maybe the master cleanse in the morning you know, as sort of a, almost like a tonic. Sure. And then um, uh, elemental heal midday, and then later in the day, the, the broth. And that combination worked well for me and helped me get through um, uh, what can be challenging when you're not eating solid food. It can, it, it can be challenging to use, you know, periodic, fasting interventions if they're true fast. Some people do it and some people have success. Um, there, there's a decent number of people, myself included, that doing too much fasting starts to cause problems with fatigue, brain fog, insomnia. So that's what's nice about things like the master's cleanse or bone broth or an elemental diet is it, it does give you, from a gut perspective, a, a rest, uh, but you're not going really low calorie and, and hitting some of that metabolic stress that can be challenging for some people. Right. Right. Yeah. I don't feel like, um, uh, I can go really low calorie because I don't really want to uh, lose muscle mass at this point, <laughs> you know, and, uh, at other times earlier in my life where I did a little bit of fasting, I just saw where it hit my muscles, you know, and, and started taking those away. And I, I can't afford that, you know, sure. But uh, yeah, I see those things as the foundation and then the, the other supplements that I use, like the uh, gut rebuild, um, uh, the um, turmeric, um, fish, fish oil, those were all things that were supportive. But I feel like those other things really like laid the foundation in the environment. Yep. Yep, and that's, yeah. and that's a key concept, and that's one of the posits I, I try to develop in Healthy Gut Healthy You, um, which is really developing this, this internal environment or, or ecosystem that has all these healthy inputs that, that really encourage it to be healthy, you know, rather than saying, well, we're going to use harsh antibiotics, which are needed in some cases, uh, or just really pound on, you know, kind of one intervention depending on what's in vogue, you know, but rather take kind of that holistic gardener approach uh, which may sound a little bit hippy dippy, but it actually, if you read in between the lines and the evidence, uh, I think that's the the approach that you come away with. And and probiotics is is one you know good example of that. Um, you know, was from, from the notes I have here in, in your chart, we were able to see a signal of improvement. I wouldn't say it was massive, but a signal of improvement from using the probiotic triple therapy as compared to you know, a health food store, probiotic X, Y, Z, but I also don't want to overrepresent that. Can, can you give us kind of your, your overview on the difference in those two different approaches to probiotics? Um, well, I think I, I felt good about using a, a broad spectrum of probiotics. And I think I wasn't getting um, as good a result earlier, uh, uh, because um, I, I don't really think it was as consistent for me where I, you know, but um, I did, I did definitely notice a difference, as I said, when I did the paleo autoimmune with the full spectrums of probiotics. Right. And prior, I was doing um, uh, more an anti-inflammatory, maybe not really the, the 
paleo, leaning more paleo sure. with a single probiotic. And it was the more like the lacto bifida type. Right. Right. And um, so those were the two things that were different. And, mm -hmm. and the second definitely pushed me forward. So, and, and this is something I've discussed with you before. Um, I can't really pinpoint one specific thing that really um, made a huge difference. It really seemed like it was everything in combination. Sure. So in, in, in that regard, that's why I can't necessarily give a very uh, yeah. exact a, yeah, answer. Also, sure. And sorry, not to cut you off, but this is also, I, I think, a really important, um, I think, lesson for any individual it's great when someone goes on probiotics and there's this zero to 60 change in like two weeks. And that does happen, but that's probably more so the minority of cases. What we see more often is you'll pick up 15 or 20% here and another 20% there. And it's when you weave together a few of those correctly that now you aggregate this 60 or 80% improvement. And I, I, I think that's so important to echo because I see so many people who come in who are well-read and they've been doing a lot of the right stuff, but the execution has been off. And, and I think right. it, in part is because people are looking for this huge change from one thing rather than thinking more, as you were saying, in this kind of methodical, iterative process where we evaluate one therapy, we see what the signal is, and then we respond accordingly. And in some cases, we need you know, the right diet plus some fasting plus some probiotics and now we finally hit that threshold where we're, we're feeling that 60, 70, 80% aggregate improvement. Right. I, I think that's what it took for me. And I, uh, let's see, for about four or five months, I did that full spectrum of things um, uh, consistently. <laughs> and um, it was a challenge at times. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, I think it was a little easier when it was during lockdown time. Lockdown, it, sure, yeah. So I was at home and not out socializing and such. So it was a little easier. But um, it was over about a five month time that just bit by bit by bit, I saw improvement. And so I was probably at the end of five months, about 80% improvement and then that's when we um uh together decided it was time to try uh antimicrobials because um uh, the one test that i had done was um SIBO breath test and that showed some uh low level of uh the, the hydro the hydrogen yeah. SIBO yeah. so and and it seemed like at that point um, there was enough healing and robustness on my part that I could handle that. So I did the- And also, sorry, just to slip in one thing there. Um, even though we had laboratory evidence of hydrogen sulfide SIBO, we had already seen a lot of benefit in your symptoms from all these therapeutics that were not lab guided. You know, right. The diet, the fasting, the probiotics. Um, and you know, I just want to reiterate that for people because I feel like there's such this strong tailwind of laboratory guided healthcare, and there is an extent to which we should do that. But but I think a lot of this more empiric, you know, personalized care is being left by the wayside, even though there's a lot here that can help people. So just you know, a quick reminder for people that probably the the minority of improvements in your case were based upon treating a lab finding. Right, right. Yeah, we didn't really even hardly ever discuss that, you know, as far as um, uh, treating to a lab finding, Right. you know. Um, oh, and uh, the other interesting point that I want to make in, in regards to, you know, having SIBO or some level of it, I have had no um, GI symptoms right. and, and no, no, um, really clear um, reactions to any particular food. So the thing that was letting me know something was off was joint pain. You know, it wasn't, it was, it was not any symptoms related to my gut. 
So um, yeah, I know that's yeah. yeah, that's not always the case. A lot of people have uh, uh, gut symptoms. No, not me at all. And I, I was could, the same. I mean, for, for me, my GI stuff manifested, you know, mostly neurologically in terms of mm -hmm. brain fog. And it's, I think it's always good to remind people that you can't have a, an issue being fueled by your gut that isn't also causing direct digestive symptoms like bloating or abdominal pain or loose stools or what have you. Yeah, yeah. Well, and when it was seeming like what was going on with me was actually autoimmune, and, and actually it was diagnosed uh, through a, a rheumatologist that um, I was diagnosed with uh, psoriatic arthritis, even though I didn't even know I had psoriasis. Right. All, my, all my blood work was negative, which is something that happens with psoriatic arthritis as opposed to rheumatoid arthritis, you know, um, there'll be positive blood test results with rheumatoid, but with psoriatic, no. Sure. So um, let's see, where was I going with this? Oh, so we were, we were, um, we decided it was time to do antimicrobials. And, and at that point before that, I was, I'd say probably 80% improved. I did the Phase one antimicrobials um, for one month, all that went fine. Um, I, I tolerated it all well. Um, I kept seeing improvement. And probably by the end of that first month, I was symptom free and I was elated. And then we went to the second phase of antimicrobials. And Initially, all that was going fine, but about two weeks in, I started having nausea, and I thought, "Hey, I'm having a, a die-off reaction." Right. <laughs> and then, but then it started really um, uh, increasing. The nausea started increasing. This was just over a period of a few days, and like I said, it was after two weeks in taking, you know, the, the next round of compounds. And then my urine started getting dark. And I looked up those symptoms. It's like, oh my God, this is like induced hepatitis or something. And so I contacted you. You said to stop everything. Uh, I, and, and also I con uh, contacted my general practitioner. Um, uh, through her, I did um, blood tests for liver enzymes. And she also had me do a uh, ultrasound on liver. And my, my liver en enzymes were very elevated. So there was something in, in the compounds that my body was not happy with. And, um, but after I stopped everything and uh, later um, took the blood tests again. Um, and this was over a period of about two months, all my uh, liver enzymes returned to normal. And, and the ultrasound uh, showed some mild fatty liver, um, but what the, the, my GP did not seem too concerned about, about, about that. And she said that the uh, recommendation for fatty liver was basically, you know, stay on a relatively low carb diet, which I was, you know, continuing on. But when that happened, I stopped everything. I stopped all the protocol. I stopped probiotics. Um, uh, and actually at that time I had started broadening my diet, which I've done. I'm basically eating everything now. Um, not tons of gluten. I'm, I'm eating some dairy, some grains, some beans. And um, I've only recently, maybe the last month or maybe a couple of months, started seeing a creeping up of symptoms again. Yep. So I'm going to circle back around and basically start the protocol over again. And um, and by protocol, just to clarify for people, diet, fasting, probiotics, some basic mm -hmm. anti-inflammatory sports, not the herbal antimicrobials. I, I, I think we've, we've gotten, 
what we need to get out of the herbal antimicrobials, at least for right now. Um, but just to kind of build upon that, the fact that you're able to go off all the supplements and really broaden your diet for months and notice little to no regression is an excellent sign. Yeah. You know, this, this is part of how we figure out where someone's minimal effective dose and plan is. Um, and what I expect we'll find is you'll probably be able to continue to be very, fairly liberal with your diet. And if we have just some basic and reasonable supports in play, that should buffer against, you know, maybe some alcohol or, or, you know, processed food or what have you, which is very similar to what I've fallen into, which is, yeah, I can be okay without any supplements, but I can better buffer, you know, a bottle of wine with friends and, you know, maybe dessert and, and what have you. And everyone's different in terms of what kind of stuff they want to take. And, and that's all good and fine. But I think the, the key here is allowing you to have that realization of, okay, like, I feel a little bit better when I'm doing X, Y, Z, and then you elect, you know, is it, or is it not worth it to modify your diet? Most of the time as such use X, Y, Z supplement and really put you in the driver's seat of being able to identify kind of the risk reward pro con for, for these decisions and not kind of have this um, boogeyman. Oh my gosh. You know, someone somewhere said that these foods can be inflammatory for some people with RA or psoriatic arthritis. So I'm, I'm never going to have those and I'm not going to qualify what I can and cannot do. Cause that, that's, you know, a couple of things that uh, I think it's important for people to realize is that sure, you know, there is a food that can be a problem for people. There's a supplement that, that can be helpful for a given person, but it doesn't mean we have to ardently follow the dietary rules or very fastidiously follow a supplement plan those are guideposts. We work through those trials iteratively, and then you decide kind of where your sweet spot is in terms of how exactly you follow those things. Right, right. As far as diet uh, restriction, um, I think it was very helpful. I, I'm seeing what I did earlier as when I was very restricted as uh, therapeutic, and that that helped me um, during that period of time is it's probably not going to always be this way, Yeah, you know, and, and I would, so that helped me sort of stay the course and, um, with, with circling back around, um, when, when I did broaden my diet, I wasn't particularly methodical about reintroducing foods back in. So, and because I'm not highly reactive um, to food tra triggers, um, I'm not sure what exactly. foods well, may. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> which is maybe, kind of a maybe, double edged sword, right? If it's super yeah. apparent, it's 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 nice. But then, do you want everything to be super apparent, right? It's, it's kind of nicer to have such minimal reactivity that's hard for you to pinpoint. So yeah, there, there's there's kind of a pro and a con to, to that. right. I'd like to have a little bit more insight, but I don't know <laughs> if I will get that. And I don't know if with holidays coming up, it's ex the exact sure. time to do it. Sure. But at the same time, since um, symptoms have increased some, I, I don't want to um, uh, just ignore them sure. either yep. because yeah, I, I don't want to backslide. Right. Yeah. And for you, it may not be any one particular food. Normally that type of presentation isn't demonstrative of a solitary food trigger, but more so it's just kind of like a volume of these inflammatory foods, right? Or, you know, whatever that is for you. And, and so it's just being a little more cognizant, almost like someone who, let's say metabolically is really carb sensitive and they go away for a week and their carb intake goes up by three X and they go, okay, it wasn't necessarily the one type of carb. It was just a total volume of carbs. Right. Where it brings back down. Then, you know, the, the metabolic, problem let's say it's weight gain uh, mm -hmm. improves itself which is mm -hmm. good that's a good boat to be in yeah yeah so we'll we'll see how it goes I'll, I'll uh, be connecting with you again in January so I'll give a report in <laughs> then of how things <laughs> oh, have solid. gone yeah great yeah well, well Susie, yeah this has been really insightful I'm glad we had a chance to kind of connect and and share all these lessons with people and obviously I'm thrilled that you are much much better than you were at baseline and, and sure there's a few maybe 
uh, finishing touches for us to determine in terms of you know your, your longer term maintenance plan. That right. being said, I think it's it's fairly apparent, and now it's just a little bit of additional granularity. Uh, but are there any kind of closing thoughts that you want to leave people with? Um, uh, well, a, f- a few things actually that. Um, uh, at least from my perspective, with my journey, um, it it may not be quick. <laughs> you know, it, it may not be an o- healing may not be just an overnight thing. I mean, I I looking back, I think I actually had some symptoms related to psoriatic arthritis ten years ago and didn't know it. Um, so it didn't take me, you know, a few weeks to get in the place where I was, where I was having symptoms. So I look at it, at it that it's not going to take me just a few weeks to get out of it. So it, although I'm very happy with the progress that I made during the, the amount of time, you know, we're talking initially some things within a few weeks of, of seeing improvement, but just um, sort of being determined to stay the course yeah. to, and, and, and to try to not di- uh, get discouraged. Um, and then I did have a setback, you know, when I um, had the reaction to my, uh, the uh, antimicrobials and that was sort of discouraging, but um you know, then I just sort of picked myself back up and kept going and um, knew that uh, I could I could keep moving forward and healing in, in a good way. So uh, I guess what I want to say, healing is not necessarily a, a quick and linear path, or at least it hasn't been for me. And I imagine it'll, you know, continue to be that way for a certain uh, amount. And then... Also, I fortunately had uh, good support at home. Uh, My spouse was um, on this food journey with me, not so much the supplements and everything, but, you know, that that was really helpful. And uh, also I had um, support from my general practitioner and also the rheumatologist that I was uh, that I am currently working with. And I told them um, that I was going to, you know, use the the gut approach uh, with dealing with this. And um, my GP was all for it. And she said, you know, if you can avoid taking the drugs, that's great. Um, Because uh, basically they're auto uh, or they're immune suppressing drugs, which I do not want to take if at all possible. And the same with the rheumatologist. He saw the results that I was getting and he said, just keep doing what you're doing. He, he didn't necessarily, he couldn't speak to um, uh, necessarily agreeing with uh, everything that I was doing or not agreeing, but um, being knowledgeable of but he was not discounting it. Yeah, and he great. said, yeah, yeah, that's great. And, and he knew enough from seeing and, you know, rheumatology journals and that type of thing that gut research is going on, but he just, he did and continues to say, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. So fortunately I have good support and I, I think that has made a, a, a big difference or, or been a, a part of helping me in this journey. Yeah. Which, which I think is, is, you know, another great point worth kind of echoing in the sense that if someone is working with a conventional provider or a natural provider who seems dogmatic and anti the other side, I recommend getting a second opinion because it, it, mm-hmm. it's, it's just, it's an admonition of, I think a bit of hubris in that whatever camp you're in has all the answers and therefore you shouldn't bother with the other camp. And that's a very untenable hypothesis, just thinking that anyone has everything figured out. Um, and sometimes I think people are a little bit slow maybe to get a second opinion, but you know, if you're having that feeling that you're being put in a box or confined, um, yeah, I mean, there are other rheumatologists and GPs out there, of course, that are gonna be open-minded and able to work collaboratively. And I think for you, 
it, it's so reassuring. So you don't feel like you're kind of in this tug of war, right? You know, you know having to contend with totally polarized opinions. Right. And in this case, because I did have, you know, some, some uh, reaction or whatever to the antimicrobial, um, I needed the GP on my side or yeah. <laughs> I needed her support. Right. And, and um, uh, she, you know, wasn't condescending or anything about that. I had some issues coming up. And in fact, the rheumatologist, when I saw him, he said, yeah, it's just like any other medicine. Sometimes you have a reaction. I was it, just going to say that. It's, it's a, and, that and that's fair, right? And, and that's, that's a fair way of looking at a therapeutic. And it's not, well, that therapeutic is in the camp of philosophy that I don't like. So right. anything I can pick at, I'm going to use to discredit it. But, but rather, yeah, people have reactions to drugs, to herbs, to vitamins, to diets. Uh, and we should just try to work through that rather than, yeah, trying to throw the, you know, the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Fantastic. Well, I think this provides people with a lot of guideposts as they're trying to improve their health and, and kind of navigate conventional alternative medicine. How do we kind of weave in between the two and, and how do we be patient and have the long view and just all these things. And, you know, many, many great lessons, uh, as I knew you would have, uh, Susie, because you are if people can't tell, very well read, very well researched, uh, very logical in your thinking. Uh, so, you know, thank you for being such a pleasure to work with and for being so committed to your health, certainly making my job easier and for, you know, sharing your story with us. Great, great. Well, I, it's been a pleasure working with you. Um, I, we'll, we still have some more to do, yeah. <laughs> but um, I really appreciate the support and, um, I, I really like your approach and the information that you're bringing forward and that you're making uh, functional medicine accessible to people in a, um, a, you know, in an attainable way. So, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Susie. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I guess we will be talking post holiday and we can debrief more then. Okay, great. Great. Right. Okay. Thank you again, Susie. All righty. Bye. Bye. -bye.